Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Everyone is touched by psychiatric conditions, either themselves or a loved one. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Today on Healthy Minds, you're taking what is already FDA approved, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation, and you're fine tuning that so that it could be individualized to specific people and that you can do it more rapidly. You can give more treatments in a shorter period of time and you're giving a, a stronger dosage of treatment with each of those treatments to get a rapid response to that treatment. That, that is correct. We're utilizing an FDA approved device, but we're using it in a very different way. We've seen folks get well as, in as little as a day and um, you know, a, a lot of people well by the fifth day. That's today on Healthy Minds. This program is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Bank of America Charitable Gift Fund, and the John and Polly Sparks Foundation. Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. It's not that often in psychiatry or all of medicine that we see a potential game changer in treatment. Today I speak with Dr. Nolan Williams, who describes his work on such a potential game changer. Nolan, thank you for joining us. I appreciate your being here virtually 3,000 miles away, but the next best thing to being here in person. So thank you for being with us. Yeah, Jeff, thanks for having me and thanks for the, the interest in the work we're doing. I want to jump right into that work because it's very exciting and can have a tremendous impact on clinical treatment. So tell us about what you're doing. We've termed this uh, Stanford Accelerated Intelligent Neuromodulation Therapy. And the idea is that we can uh, reorganize the stimulation involved in repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation so that it's applied um, in a different way in space, in time, and in dose. And so the, the space piece is that we're utilizing personalized neuroimaging um, based off of an individual's um, functional neuroanatomy to place the coil in the best spot for their brain to stimulate. Um, and the second bit is that we're reorganizing the stimulation in time. So this idea that we can apply a whole lot of stimulation in a short period of time. So we can actually apply a six week course of conventional RTMS um, worth of stimulation in a, uh, in a single day. So um, the way that we typically apply something called intermittent theta burst stimulation, which is this new form of stimulation that can be applied um, you know, over a six week course, we can do that um, in a single day and give the same dose. And then the third innovation is this ability to do a dose response curve with our TMS. So we can actually apply you know, five times the amount of stimulation that's normally applied in six weeks um, in five days. And we're able to get um, you know, a much larger percentage of folks well in that short period of time. So it's really those three innovations. So you're, you're, taking, you're taking what is already FDA approved, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, and you're fine tuning that so that it could be individualized to specific people and that you can do it more rapidly. You could give more treatments in a shorter period of time and you're giving a, a stronger dosage of treatment with each of those treatments to get a rapid response to that treatment. Absolutely, so we're, yeah, th that is correct. We're utilizing an FDA approved device, but we're using it in a very different way than any of the previous um, trials have utilized um, this device. So we're, we're really using it in this rapid kind of personalized way. And I think that's, um, you know, that's probably part of the ingredient to why we're seeing such both a robust effect and a very rapid one. Um, we've seen folks get well as, in as little as a day and um, you know, a, the, a lot of people well by the fifth day. And so that's, um, that's been the observation so far. Let's uh, take a step back and just explain how does this work? How does using magnets to the head, how does that work? Absolutely. 
So, um, you know, we've known for, for a long time a um, uh, principle called Faraday's Law where um, if you pulse a magnet, you can generate a current in electrically conducting substances. And so that's, that principle's been around uh, for some time. It was first tested by Tony Barker in 1985 in humans and, and published in the Lancet then. And so, you know, our, um, our moves here were to, to really take that to the next level and really be able to, to personalize it and really uh, you know, utilize the neuroscience that's emerged over the last 20 years around how the brain learns to really, um, to really extend this approach to a larger group of people. And there, there hasn't been, prior to our work, there hasn't been a, um, you know, a strategy to do this uh, in, a, in kind of a blinded prospective way where you're giving uh, a certain amount of stimulation um, over a period of time, and then you're looking at behavior change. So um, as all the pharmacologists know, what you wanna see is you wanna see escalating dose and a flattening or plateauing of the curve. So then you have a sense of, okay, if I give more dose here, I'm not gonna necessarily improve behavior, and then I may, you know, in the case of drugs, increase risk. And what we observed is that um, if you look at the FDA-approved dose that, um, that's been approved for intermittent theta burst, it's, it's only the first day of stimulation for us. And we see a certain percentage of folks that get better after that first day, but then, um, then the subsequent four days, we're giving you know, uh, accumulation of a total of five times the amount of stimulation that, uh, that we give with an FDA approved um, treatment course. And so that allows us to really try to get a sense, if we give more dose, do we pick up more and more improvement over time? And, and that's what we've observed. We've observed that as you treat people with more and more pulses, you pick up more and more remitters as you go further and further into that week. And, and that's been an interesting kind of third dosing principle. And so, you know, this, um, these, these three things seem to be important for its effect. If you, you know, if you cut the dose short and you only give a day, for instance, you're not going to give, you're not going to get um, the, the level of, um, of improvement that we see across the board with folks after five days. If you do the spacing, you know, we did some early piloting with different spacing. If you do the spacing, at a non-optimal um, level, then you, you don't get the same clinical effects. And so, you know, we, we have a sense that it's really this set of ingredients that, that, uh, that allows for this level of efficacy. And in your, your preliminary work with this, you're finding a very high rate of response, much higher than with typical medications and much higher than with the, the more traditional uses of transcranial magnetic stimulation. Absolutely. So what we've observed is if you look at the first, at the end of the first day, that's the dose of, of the, you know, equivalent dose of a conventionally applied theta burst six weeks, and you get about the same numbers. But if you keep going, then you pick up more and more responders and remitters as you get deeper into the five days um, of, of the treatment week. And so that suggests, um, you know, a potential underdosing historically, which is if, if, you know, that's what we've observed and if other people observe the same thing too, it's great news, right? Because TMS is exceedingly safe. And that's just a suggestion that maybe we've been a little bit too safe. Uh, and in reality, it's quite safe and you can give this, these higher doses and people do quite well. And part of what's so exciting, in, in addition to the response rate, is how quickly people are able, people respond to the treatment. Talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we've observed folks, um, you know, achieve benefit anywhere from from one to five days. The younger, less treatment resistant folks that we've treated, you know, two, three, four med failures instead of ten, you know, you start to see those folks get better at the end of the first day or two days, and it's really dramatic and it's really exciting. You know, there, there's not a neuromodulation treatment that can do this in this short period of time. Certainly, ketamine can have this level of speed. We've observed, um, you know, decently good uh, durability on this as well. And so it's, it's nice in the sense that we have, you know, relatively rapid acting approach that seems to, to stick around for a while. And, uh, and, and I think that's, that's really exciting. So we can get people out of 
psychiatric emergencies um, in a very short period of time and get them back and, and well so and back out of the hospital. So this is for certainly when I went to medical school and residency, when you went to medical school and residency, the idea of a, of a treatment that could act so rapidly um, was, we didn't even think that was possible yet, but this is yeah. truly a potential game changer in the treatment of acute depression and suicidal risk. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, I think the, the beauty of, of the ketamine work that's been done so far is that I think the field got to see that, yes, we can actually see depression change this fast. And, and, and you know, that, that aspect of ketamine really inspired thinking about this, um, you know, in, in, in a similar sort of vein. You know, we see, um, see folks get well in time frames that we normally don't think folks can get well in. And it's, it's really exciting. And I think it, it speaks to the idea that we're tapping into kind of the central mechanisms around mood regulation. You know, one way of thinking about this is this is a rapid acting treatment to treat psychiatric emergencies in settings that we haven't really had consistently had a treatment in. The other way to think about it is, well, we've got a probe that's non-invasive that seems to work in a broad range of folks. We've seen it work in, even in people that have failed electroconvulsive therapy. And so as a probe and a neuroscientific tool, it's really exciting because it feels like it's something closer to a kind of a complete probe. We can really perturb the, the brain circuitry of a wide range of people and we're ethically justified to do so because the risk benefit ratio is so on the benefit side of things. And so being able to use it as a probe, ask the questions of what does this probe do in less treatment and more treatment resistant folks? How, does, how, do, how do the brains differ? How do the brain responsivity um, differences, um, what, what are reflected in the differences in the brain responsivity to this probe? So I think I think that's that's an another another exciting aspect of, of this work is being able to say okay we've we've got a probe we can really explore things with the I, I want you to talk a little bit about side effects that people may have experienced with this treatment. Side effects, yeah. So one of the one of the side effects that is kind of the predominant one that we saw was different between the you know the, it wasn't statistically significantly different but different different um, you know at a level between the two groups. Um, was the, the rate of headache. It didn't seem to really affect the blind at all. These were all mild headaches. They were all Tylenol responsive and lasted a few hours. But the, the folks in the active group had, you know, slightly more headache. Other than that, we really haven't seen much. You know, I was very conscientious of the idea that we were going to have to convince folks that this was cognitively okay to do, right? You're giving this much stimulation in a day. You have to justify that the risk um, for doing this is, is not really, um, is marginal, not really there. And, and that's what we observed, right? If anything, people's, co you know, certain domains of patients' cognition actually improved. A lot of cognition actually stayed the same. There, there were no patterns to say that it worsened at all. And, um, and that's a big deal in contrast to ECT where there are known you know, neuropsychological um, effects of ECT on the kind of autobiographical memory um, for some people. And so that, that's a contrast there. And then the other piece is folks generally worry about seizure. They worry about seizure as it relates to, um, you know, to TMS, because in the early days before we knew what we know now, there were, there were a couple of seizures that happened. Subsequently, it's been a very rare event, and a lot of it's been due to operator error in, in conventional RTMS. In our hands, we have yet to see any seizures with this approach, which is also great news. And so in more than 100 people, we've not observed a single seizure um, in individuals receiving this. And, uh, you know, it, it appears to be, you know, ex exceedingly safe in that way. And so no seizures, no cognitive issues. And uh, the rest of the side effects that are, you know, adverse events that we saw in the trial, in the randomized control trial, um, both groups had it. So fatigue, you know, we've, we observed a specific type of a fatigue that people talk about they didn't see as being really related to their depression at all, but just being there all day. You know, both groups uh, experienced that. It is, these are long days. People sleep off some of that fatigue on the Saturday after their Monday through Friday course, and then they're feeling great. Um, you know, if, if they got active and they're doing well, um, you know, early that next week. And so that's, that's something to know, you know, and that's really the, there's some, some people have some sensitivity to the nerve uh, effects of TMS as a generality, not specific to this, but, um, but really that's it. So it's, 
in the scheme of things with everything that's being explored right now as potential treatments for people with treatment resistant depression, it's side effect kind of risk benefit ratio looks really good. So, and I wanna emphasize what you just said, which is these are treatment resistant depression patients. These are people who have tried other things, a few different medicines, other types of treatment, and it didn't work. And for these people who have this kind of response, it really changes their life. They're, they're for the first time in, in many years, they're feeling well. Absolutely, yeah, that's a great point. So really interesting um, you know, group that we just um, published on in our randomized control trial. Um, really sick folks, very unfortunate group of people who um, about 50% of them were actually disabled from depression and their average length of their current depre depressive episode, how long they've been depressed you know, kind of continuously in time for this last episode was around nine years, you know. So this, these were people who were not even typical conventional RTMS trial participants. These were sick, sick patients, uh, patients that, you know, and doing ECT over the years are really outpatient ECT patients, right? Um, and, uh, you know, both in level of treatment resistance and current severity and all of that. And, uh, you know, had some really really exciting, really dramatic improvements in these folks' lives. And, um, you know, for, for a good, good bit of the folks that got active, really transpo transformative for quite some time for and them. And you, you said um, that it lasts. You know, we do. How, what do you do for ongoing care to, to maintain them, uh, their, their response to the treatment? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, our first trial participant, you know, knock on wood, I think he's um, still well. Last time I checked in with him a couple of months ago, he was still well at four years. Um, we've had folks who've lost it quicker than that. Um, you know, on average, it's a couple of months. The, um, you know, we, we've had a few folks with, that have failed electroconvulsive therapy or quite severe um, individuals, kind of the, the furthest on the, the bell curve of, of severity. Those individuals need, um, you know, an aggressive kind of saint uh, style maintenance stimulation where they're getting you know more stimulation um, throughout the day what's interesting is i think you can treat somebody that's very early in the treatment algorithm um, you know that's you know we've done this with quite severe folks in the inpatient unit that came in after a suicide attempt were very ill but not particularly treatment resistant you know and they get uh, you know very durable effects um, as a generality some folks that need maintenance, and then we've been thinking about how do you do this with an implanted cortical stimulator and, and do the same sort of stimulation patterns, direct electrical instead of induced with a magnet, to really treat people ongoing that need really frequent stimulation. And I think that's kind of the kind of the, the mental model is that we you know this is a uh, it's not just a TMS approach, but this is a neurostimulation approach for stimulating cortex that. Uh, is really like platform technology across a lot of potential modalities. And, uh, and that's one of the things I'm most excited about, um, that we can potentially keep the whole range of folks well that are responsive to this. In addition to uh, treating people with depression, what other conditions do you envision this being helpful for? Absolutely. So a group of us worked on um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, it was a small pilot, but three out of seven of those patients with uh, treatment resistant OCD crossed the remission line. Y box less than 10, the L Brown obsessive compulsive score. And, um, and that's really exciting because as you know, Jeff, these, these folks, remission is not a term that's utilized very frequently in, in OCD circles. And so to see that, that sort of improvement is really great. Um, We've had uh, foundation funding to look at this in, um, in borderline personality disorder and folks with uh, BPD and depression, um, some, some funding to look at uh, bipolar disorder, both uh, mania and depression. And that initial work um, you know, has helped to, to, um, to, to be prelim data for multiple funded uh, grants going forward, looking at both major depression and bipolar two. And so, um, you know, and, and in addition to looking at this in outpatients, we did some piloting kind of um, feasibility work um, with, with inpatients uh, that were suicidal. And now um, the NIH has been generous enough to, to fund a, 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 um, a randomized control trial of about 100 individuals uh, here at Stanford to, to assess 
uh, the effects in suicidal, actively suicidal folks. So really understanding some of the very basic science of how the brain works and what parts of the brain may be affected by different conditions allows these clinical interventions aiming at the specific part of the brain, the circuits in the brain that may have caused depression, OCD, some of the other conditions. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the um, basic and translational work that's been done over the last three decades, had, you know, it was essential to understanding what we needed, what pieces of this engineering puzzle we needed to put together to make this work. And it was really a you know, initially an engineering experiment that obviously when we did some science and did a randomized control trial on, it was really utilizing the, the basic uh, and translational neuroscience over, you know, really since the 80s and 90s all the way till when we started working on this, um, you know, around 2015, 2014, um, to, to put this together. And uh, without that work and without essentially Federal funding and funding from from foundations um, like NARSAD, um, you know, I, I don't think that um, that this sort of clinical innovation would be possible. We wouldn't have known what to do um, without that that kind of basic information to guide us. Nolan, let me ask you, where do you see this going over the, ne the next 5, 10, 20 years? Where do, where do you see this work leading us to? I can see a future where someone with um, with suicidal depression comes in the emergency room, at some point gets an MRI scan, at some point gets set up to, to receive, you know, this stimulation or, or some next generation version of this. And, um, and that, you know, allows for them to achieve uh, remission response to suicidal depression, elimination of the suicidal behaviors and thoughts, and then they can leave the hospital, um, you know, in a safe way. That's in contrast to the current um, scenario where in people that are admitted to psychiatric hospitalization for their first mood disorder episode, their risk of completed and attempted suicide in the three months after that hospitalization is the highest lifetime. And, you know, a, a future, a particularly, you know, optimistic, hopeful future of mine is that, that we would be able to see that, right? That people would come into the hospital for suicidal depression exactly once. And that we would be able to, in, in a lot of those people, maybe not everybody, but in a lot of those people, we'd be able to maintain them with, uh, with these sorts of protocols or versions of these sorts of protocols outpatient and turn, turn this into a similar sort of setting. And so it's a big dream, you know, who knows um, if, if we can pull it off. And, um, you know, we, there's a lot of work to be done, but I think it's, a, it's an important one. It's one that if the field could get there, um, it would change a lot of lives. It would change the way that we think about these, this particular illness and hopefully related illnesses that we, we think we can, um, we can have an effect on with this, this technology and um, you know, hopefully make it a safer, a safer sort of scenario for folks suffering from this. Well, I, I agree with you. It, it's a big dream, but the only way you have um, big advancements uh, is with a big dream. And the idea that somebody could be acutely suicidal with depression and have a quick response to treatment that continues to um, stay, that, so the depression and suicide risk stays in remission, um, is a game changer in our field. So a person doesn't need to stay in the hospital for a few weeks until the depression and suicide risk lifts. Um, they could go home after a few days when it lifts and then have ongoing treatment. So it, it's a dream that really is a game changer and your, your work is helping to make that dream potentially come true. Yeah, thanks Jeff. Yeah, we, we, we hope so. I mean, I think that's definitely, you know, I'd, I'd love for that to be the case if it did. Nolan, I wanna thank you for all the work that you've done for joining us today to share that. And just as importantly for the work that you going to do in the future that will have such an impact on so many lives. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an exciting time and really appreciative of um, all the different um, funding agencies that, uh, that support basic translational and clinical neuroscience research. It really uh, makes a big difference and allows for us to develop um, these sorts of treatments and, uh, and explore um, what needs to be explored to, to kind of improve the field and improve the lives of, of folks suffering. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you in person in the very near future. 
Sounds great. Thanks, Jeff. As a psychiatrist, I'm truly inspired to hear about people who have treatment-resistant depression finally get help, get better. It demonstrates that through research and advancements in treatment, with help, there is hope. suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. This program is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Bank of America Charitable Gift Fund, and the John and Polly Sparks Foundation. Remember, with help, there is hope.